the acting uh, Prime Minister of Fiji, the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State, and members of the media. Mbulivinaka um, to you all. A special welcome to the uh, Secretary of State, uh, Blinken, uh, members of your delegation, and your accompanying uh, media team. I welcome you to our joint press conference, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, I now invite the acting Prime Minister of Fiji, the Honorable Ayaz Dayat Kayum, to deliver uh, his address. You have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you. Bula uh, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to welcome uh, Secretary Blinken and his delegation and the American media to Fiji in particular. We are at the crossroads of a 40 million square kilometer patch of Pacific Ocean that is governed by the Pacific Islands and our neighbors, Australia and New Zealand. Most world maps cut out our region right down the middle. So you may not know by looking, but we are the largest ocean continent in the world. That big blue responsibility is linked to the well-being of every person on Earth. Despite that, Fiji and our small state neighbors have felt at times, to borrow an American term, like a flyover country. Small dots spotted from plain windows of leaders en route to meetings where they spoke about us rather than with us, if they spoke of us at all. When the USA signaled its intent to leave the Paris Agreement, we felt forgotten by a superpower. So of course we welcome President Biden's promise to the world that America was back. Mr. Secretary, your being here shows that promise was more than words. We've just held the most historic and comprehensive meeting ever between Fiji and the USA and a wider meeting with our fellow Pacific leaders. We believe that both mark the start of a more direct partnership between Fiji and the USA in a new era for America in the blue frontier of the Pacific. The last significant American presence we felt in Fiji were soldiers we welcomed here during the Second World War. We face a new war today, a climate war that is devastating our people unlike any conflict before it. There is no region of the world, not in the Pacific, not in Europe, not in the Americas, that will be spared its consequences. Fourteen cyclones have struck Fiji since we signed the Paris Agreement, each storm driving home the urgency of adapting and curbing global emissions. This week, Bar Town, an hour's drive away from here, was flooded for the third time in three months. Six communities in Fiji have been moved to escape the rising seas, with 40 others in the queue. Not to mention the bleaching reefs and erratic weather patterns that threaten our people's livelihoods and ways of life. We, of course, aren't alone. When Pacific Islands are sinking, Texas is freezing, California is burning, and New York is flooding. When a superstorm misses Fiji, American Samoa is in the crosshairs. And Hawaii, Guam, and FSM know many of Fiji's struggles because they actually live them. Fiji and America are both working in support of a more secure, stable, and Pacific region, and indeed a peaceful region. But there is far more we need to do together as partners in this battle of our lives. As a nation that shares many of our struggles and our values, America is uniquely positioned to be a direct partner to Fiji for peace and climate security, not only across the Indo-Pacific, but here in the Blue Pacific. And not only because America is a large emitter that must cut its carbon emissions, but because it is an innovator that can create climate solutions. And we need American might and its minds, as well as pioneering solutions and investments here at the shores of this blue frontier. Our discussions, ladies and gentlemen, covered our commitment to uphold the rule of law in our region, including the law of sea. As we move to sustainably manage and protect our ocean, we sought to jointly up our game through our navies, militaries, and our Fiji police force through maritime surveillance cooperation to end illegal fishing, combat transnational crime, and ensure that this is an ocean decade of exploration and discovery, not exploitation and destruction. In this respect, we also discussed the opportunities for greater participation from the USA in the Australian-funded BlackRock facility in Fiji to coordinate joint responses to the catastrophic event, not just in Fiji, but in the wider Pacific. During our meeting, we welcome America's net zero commitment, as well as Mr. Blinken's recent pledge to decarbonize operations within the State Department. Fijians believe in leading by example as well, which is why, despite our emissions being negligible, 
we committed to achieving net zero by 2050. Mitigation and adaptation both require access to technology we do not have and which major market powers like the USA can help us deploy, including in blue shipping. And that means jobs for Fijians, jobs in cutting edge technology and from nature that both can build the future. We also spoke on Fiji's role in leading a regional recovery from the pandemic. With the support of the USA and our development partners, over 90% of Fijians over the age of 15 are fully vaccinated, which allowed us to welcome American visitors from the 1st of December last year. And we hope to welcome many more, including your families and the many Americans watching us today. We are also keen to open more of the US export market to our farmers. We love to export more of our kava, the experience our kava ceremony, <laughs> as well as ginger, taro, turmeric, sugar, Fijian chocolates, cosmetics, and other Fijian grown and Fijian made products to the US. We also welcome US firms looking to participate in our growing outsourcing services sector. We have young, well spoken, English speaking, tech savvy, and frankly, very friendly people who would love the opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, this visit reaffirms that the ocean and islands that fall under our region's responsibility are too vital for our people and for the planet for any leader to fly over or overlook. Mr. Secretary, your visit to Fiji is the first in almost 40 years. But today has not been about the last 40, four decades or 40 years. It is about the many more to come. Decades that our nations will meet together as enduring partners with shared values enlisted with humanity in overcoming the greatest challenges of our time. It is now my privilege, ladies and gentlemen, to invite our friend, Secretary Blinken, to make his remarks. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Well, look, I'm, uh, I'm tempted to close my book because it's very hard to top the eloquence of the acting prime minister. I think he captured powerfully uh, the afternoon that we've spent uh, together, but also the perspective that we share on the future, the future for the United States and Fiji, the future for the United States, and all of our friends and partners uh, in, the, in the Pacific. And I want to thank you, uh, not only for the incredible graciousness of your hospitality today, but also for your leadership of the, I think, uh, truly extraordinary session that we had with uh, friends and partners from throughout the region. Uh, it was incredibly valuable uh, to me, to, uh, to our team, and I really thank you very much for that. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be here, uh, and Nandi, to be uh, as it turns out, the first Secretary of State to visit Fiji in 36 years, going back to, to Secretary Schultz. Um, and I really want to thank uh, the people of Fiji for welcoming us today. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time, if I can, this evening covering um, the important ground that we walked on today as we uh, look to the future. Before I do that, um, I want to uh, say a few words about uh, something that is going on um, half a world away from here, but that is profoundly relevant to, uh, to this region, uh, and that is uh, the situation in and around uh, Ukraine. Uh, we continue to see very troubling signs of Russian escalation, including new forces uh, arriving around Ukraine's borders. Uh, as I said yesterday, we're in the window uh, when a Russian invasion can start at any time if President Putin so decides. That includes in the coming days. We don't know whether President Putin has made that decision, but we do know that he has put in place the capacity uh, to act on very short notice. Uh, throughout the, the trip that we've been on, um, I've been in very close coordination with uh, the national security team back in Washington, including multiple discussions with President Biden uh, on our plans and preparations, uh, and of course with our charge in Kyiv. Uh, I've also engaged with counterparts around the world uh, on our ongoing diplomatic efforts. In recent days, I've spoken to the French Foreign Minister Le Drian, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg, our Quad allies and partners, of course, Australia, India, Japan. Uh, I spoke earlier today with my Ukrainian counterpart, Foreign Minister Kaleva, um, and uh, I'll speak this evening with Foreign Secretary Truss of, uh, of the United Kingdom. We have a remarkable level of unity and common purpose. We and our allies have made this crystal clear to Moscow. If President Putin decides to take military action, we will swiftly impose severe economic sanctions in coordination with allies and partners around the globe. We'll bolster Ukraine's ability to defend itself. We will reinforce our allies on the eastern flank of NATO. I'll underscore this unity and resolve when I speak with 
Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, a little bit later this evening. I'll also make clear, as I have consistently, that if Russia is genuinely interested in resolving this crisis of its own making through diplomacy and dialogue, we're prepared to do that. In fact, that's our preferred path. It's the right and responsible thing to do. But it must take place in the context of de-escalation. So far, we've only seen escalation from Moscow. This is a pivotal moment. We're prepared for whatever should happen. As I've said throughout this trip, our return to the Indo-Pacific now, even as we continue to work relentlessly to resolve the crisis in Ukraine, is in itself a demonstration of our commitment to staying focused on this region. And that includes the Pacific Islands. Uh, when Secretary Schultz was here uh, in 1985, he praised Fiji for being a diverse democracy. And as he put it, and I quote, a member of the international community that's done your share and more as a peacekeeper in a troubled world. And he expressed hope that the ties of friendship and cooperation between Fiji and the United States would grow closer and stronger in the years ahead. Today, Fiji is again a democracy, which is a credit to the perseverance and determination of its people. Fiji has been a proud contributor to peacekeeping operations around the world for 43 years and counting. Just in the past few months, you've sent help to Tonga uh, after the eruption and tsunami and to the Solomon Islands to help bring an end to recent violence. And just as Secretary Schultz hoped, the ties between our countries, between Fiji and the United States, have grown stronger and closer, including on security, on health, climate, trade and investment, promoting regional and global cooperation. That partnership serves not only our countries, but many others, because Fiji and all of the Pacific Island nations are a vital part of the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, a few months ago, when uh, I was in Indonesia, uh, I had a chance to preview uh, my country's approach to this vast and vital part of the world. I laid out the five core elements of our engagement. First, advancing a free and open Indo-Pacific. Second, forging stronger connections within and beyond the region. Third, promoting broad-based prosperity. Fourth, helping build resilience. And fifth, bolstering security. Today, the United States is releasing our Indo-Pacific strategy in full. It's the result of a year of intensive engagement and consultation with allies and partners across the region and beyond, and hearing directly from its people about what's most important to them. And it reflects the fundamental <coughs> truth that no region on Earth will affect the lives and livelihoods of Americans more than the Indo-Pacific, which accounts for 60 percent of the global economy, two-thirds of all economic growth over the last five years. Uh, Every defining issue of uh, the 21st century runs through this region. Uh, the climate crisis, global health, the future of technology, whether nations will be free to chart their own path or be subject to coercion by more powerful nations. Our strategy is built on collaboration. We want to develop sustained, innovative, mutually reinforcing partnerships across the Indo-Pacific with our allies, our partners, with regional institutions like ASEAN, APEC, which the United States will host next year, the Pacific Islands Forum, which Fiji is chairing this year. The Acting Prime Minister and I just came from a meeting of the Pacific Island Forum where I reinforced my country's commitment to the region and the PIF's critical role in driving regional action. We welcome the decision of the Micronesian states to pause their withdrawal from the PIF to allow for continued discussions. Uh, we're strengthening our relationships in every corner of the region, building on our long-standing ties in Northeast Asia and Australia and New Zealand, uh, investing more deeply in the Pacific Islands, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. We're also forging new connections across continents between our European and Indo-Pacific partners, as only the United States can do. The European Union's first ever Indo-Pacific strategy aligns with our own, and the United States is increasingly speaking with one voice with our NATO allies and our G7 partners when it comes to Indo-Pacific matters. You can see the strength of that commitment to the Indo-Pacific throughout the past year. Just look at uh, some of the key markers on our calendar, from President Biden being the first U.S. President to address the Pacific Islands Forum, to our increasing engagement with the Quad, whose ministers I just met with in Melbourne, to deepening our cooperation on a range of security and defense priorities through AUKUS. We also intend to open a U.S. Embassy uh, in the Solomon Islands, in its capital city to deepen our cooperation 
with Pacific Island partners. And these steps are only the beginning. We'll continue to advance our engagement and investments in the Indo-Pacific. That includes in the Pacific Islands, because what happens here matters to the United States. We share a history. It was here on these beaches that Americans waged some of the hardest fought battles of the Second World War. Our people are closely tied together by large Pacific Islander diaspora in the United States. As much as any other place in the world, these islands are ground zero for the devastating impact of climate change. And I heard that so powerfully and eloquently from uh, our colleagues this afternoon. Uh, it resonates, not just as something that we think about, but something that actually touches us here. Because for so many of our partners here, this is truly the existential issue of our times. And we're committed to tackling that challenge, to meeting it head on, to doing it together. And here in the Pacific Islands, we see a clear example of why standing up for a free and open Indo-Pacific matters for real people. Pacific Islanders are proud. They believe that no matter their size, they alone should be able to choose their path, whether that's how they manage their natural resources or who they partner with. We share that belief, and we think the world is a more secure and prosperous place when core international principles like that are respected, whether that's here in the Pacific, in Ukraine, or anywhere else. You see the strength of our commitment to the region in our partnership with Fiji. Together, our countries are taking on major issues facing not only us, uh, but countries throughout the region uh, and indeed beyond. On COVID-19, for example, the United States has provided more than 700,000 vaccine doses to Pacific Island countries, including Fiji. We're working together to build Fiji's capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to future health emergencies. On security, just this week, three uh, ship riders from Fiji are joining the crew of the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Stratton to conduct patrols uh, in support of maritime sovereignty and security. And the United States is proud that several of Fiji's future leaders are being trained in our military academies. On climate, Fiji and other Pacific Island nations have been leading voices, powerful voices, calling for the world's major economies to take strong action to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Fiji was the first country in the world to ratify the Paris Agreement. In Glasgow, the United States announced our goal of mobilizing $150 billion in public and private climate finance by 2030. We intend for a substantial portion of that money to support climate adaptation in Fiji and throughout the Pacific region. The thread that runs through all of our engagements with Fiji is that we're working together in a spirit of partnership, in a spirit of respect, to tackle shared challenges, to build upon shared opportunities, to deliver concrete results for people on the issues that actually affect their lives. And that's the approach behind our Indo-Pacific strategy as a whole. This isn't about opposing any country. It's about the shared future we want to build together for people across this region. We're proud to be building that future with Fiji. So thank you again, Acting Prime Minister. Thank you to all the people here uh, for such a warm welcome. Look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, um, Acting Prime Minister and uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, for your statements um, this evening. Uh, given the time constraints and also that um, Secretary Blinken has got other engagements um, tonight, I would um, ask or inform the, our media that there are only two questions um, that we will have. I will ask the first question, and Mr. Uh, Ned uh, Price will ask the, the second. So the first question I would ask uh, Mr. Nasokia to ask you a question, please. Dolvina, Secretary Blinken. Uh, you just returned from the Quad uh, meeting, which has a center lot on security. What do you see as Fiji's role in this strategy? What is it for us, the people of Fiji? And in addition to that, as climate change and natural disaster relief being the top priorities of Pacific Island countries, including Fiji, is there a package of concrete commitment on such issues from the U.S. during this visit? Um, I'm happy to, happy to start. Um, I think what's most important, whether it is uh, the Quad countries, whether it's uh, our partnership and relationship with Fiji, whether it's what 
uh, we're doing here uh, with Pacific Island partners and nations, all of which is reflected in our Indo-Pacific strategy, is that we're, we start with a shared commitment to the same values, to democracy, to human rights, to the rule of law, uh, to regional peace uh, and stability. Um, that is the, the common denominator that joins uh, the Quad, that joins our relationship. And together, we're committed to a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, in which people can live their lives uh, freely and make their own decisions, in which countries can uh, engage together and uh, choose with whom they, uh, they work uh, and associate, uh, and in which we together try to build an affirmative vision uh, for the future, and one that actually delivers concrete results for our people, both in meeting the challenges that we're facing that are very evident to, uh, to, to everyone now, starting with, with COVID, uh, climate, uh, the impact of emerging technologies on, on all of our lives, uh, as well as um, uh, finding the opportunity that I think is so powerful in this, uh, in this region. We have incredibly young populations, a great human resource to work with. Uh, we have, throughout the region, uh, economies that represent 60% uh, uh, of, uh, of world GDP uh, and uh, that have been the fastest growing uh, before the, uh, the COVID crisis. We're going to emerge and bounce back better from that. Uh, but a big part of this, I think, is for all of us to uphold some of the uh, basic principles that are critical to, uh, to peace and security uh, and stability. And that's what we're committed to, do, uh, to doing as well. We've, uh, we talked about that with the, uh, the Quad, uh, and uh, we talked about that today as well with our, our colleagues and partners here. Thank you. It was more, more for Secretary Blinken, wasn't the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Would you? Would I, I apologize. Can you repeat the uh, the second part of the, the question? Is uh, climate change and natural disaster relief being the top priorities of ah. the Pacific? Yeah. So yes, I think uh, we we spent uh, a lot of time talking uh, about uh, about climate change, about what we're doing uh, together to uh, to meet that, both uh, in terms of the uh, meeting that. Uh, that we had, but also uh, in the meeting with all of our Pacific uh, Island partners. Uh, there are a number of common themes that jumped out, but that was certainly at the very, very top of the list. So let me just say this. Uh, first, as you've seen over the last year, um, President Biden, the United States, is committed to leading uh, this effort uh, around the world to deal with cli climate change, uh, to make sure that we meet the, the existential challenge of our time. We've raised our own. Uh, ambition as one of the leading emitters in the world and historically the largest emitter, it is our responsibility to do that. We're encouraging and working with other countries uh, to do the same. Um, we're making it very clear that uh, for all of the objectives that we set for 2045 or 2050, if we don't take these steps now in the next years, over the next decade, we're not going to get there. We're not going to be able to meet the goal that we've set of keeping warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So the United States remains committed to, uh, to leading, to working with others on that. But at the same time, we also have a responsibility to help uh, countries adapt, uh, to build resilience, to make sure that they have uh, the resources, that they have access to the financing and the technology uh, to uh, strengthen uh, themselves, to be able to uh, both resist the immediate impacts of climate change and to adjust and adapt uh, their, uh, their economies, their systems uh, going forward. So we've done uh, a lot of work about, uh, on that. We've, uh, we talked about that today at, uh, at some length. Um, the President announced uh, a commitment to work with our Congress to provide $3 billion every year by 2024 for what we call the PREPARE uh, program. And through PREPARE, uh, we're going to help more than 500 million people uh, adapt and manage the impacts of climate change by 2030. One aspect of this, this is something we talked about today, is strengthening access to finance, uh, which we know is one of the top priorities. We heard that repeatedly uh, from colleagues today. USAID uh, is working to help countries obtain direct accreditation to apply for uh, and manage multilateral climate finance. To date, we've helped mobilize more than $220 million in projects here uh, in, in the Pacific. So we have a, a comprehensive approach to this. We have a commitment uh, to this. We have a responsibility to this. And what I want to just conclude with is that I think 
we've seen Fiji set the example, the first country to ratify Paris, but also um, signing, uh, signing on to, giving its voice to um, the major initiatives that are necessary if we're going uh, to really address this, this crisis. For example, the Global Methane Pledge. Uh, Fiji's not a large uh, emitter, but the fact that it's added its voice to this pledge, I think, is going to inspire other countries to take the pledge uh, and uh, make a very big contribution to curbing uh, global warming. Our question goes to Himera Permic of Reuters. <coughs> Good evening. Prime Minister, um, I have a couple of questions. They're very quick, so please bear with me. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Will the United States be evacuating its embassy in Kiev? Regarding your call with Foreign Minister Lavrov, what can the West possibly offer Putin so that he can walk away uh, from this crisis saving face? Mm -hmm. Yesterday, you said an invasion of Ukraine by Russia during the Olympics is now possible. So does the United States believe that Putin has gotten some sort of a blessing from China during his meeting with Xi at the Olympics last week? Um, and finally, to both of you on in the Pacific, it seems the US only tries to grow its presence in the region when it perceives security threats, Japan during World War II and now China. How does the U.S. maintain authentic engagement that speaks to the real needs of the islanders? How can U.S. help them with climate change, for example, and also in balancing China's presence here? Thank you. Okay. Thanks. I'll see if I can. I'll, I'll start <laughs> and, see, and see if I can remember the, uh, the excellent multi-part question. <laughs> um, first, with regard to our embassy, as I, as I noted, I think, last night when we, uh, when we last spoke, uh, we've been uh, continuing to um, uh, to uh, focus on uh, on our embassy, uh, and I think uh, this is something we're <laughs> focused on as we speak. Uh, I'll have more to say about that. We'll have more to say about that in the coming hours. With regard to um, my conversation with uh, with Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, a short time from now, and and where Russia goes from here. We have been as clear as we possibly can be uh, throughout this, this crisis, a crisis again created by Russia's actions and massing forces uh, along Ukraine's borders, that uh, there are two paths forward, uh, and it is ultimately up to, uh, to President Putin to decide which path to follow. One is diplomacy and dialogue to try to resolve the, um, uh, the differences uh, through, uh, uh, through dialogue, through diplomacy. We've been uh, very focused on, in close coordination with all of our partners and allies, uh, making clear that we're prepared to, uh, we're prepared to do that. Uh, we've shared uh, ideas with, uh, with Russia that um, address some of its concerns, that raise the many concerns that we have about uh, actions that Russia's taken to uh, undermine security, uh, and that looks at possible ways forward that, on a reciprocal basis, could actually strengthen collective security. Uh, Russia said that uh, it would respond to uh, some of the uh, ideas we put forward. We still have not seen uh, that response. Um, I'll be asking Minister Lavrov if we can anticipate seeing a response in the, uh, in the coming days to see if we can carry the dialogue uh, forward. But as we've done that, we've been equally clear that if Russia chooses the path of aggression, um, it will face massive consequences, which we have uh, outlined repeatedly and, uh, again, not just from us, but from allies and partners around the world. Uh, and we're, as I noted, in very close coordination and, and collaboration uh, with them. So President Putin will have to decide which, uh, which path to follow. We are prepared uh, either way. Uh, it's clear what the responsible path is, uh, but, as I said, we're, we're prepared uh, either way. I don't know uh, what, uh, what was said between um, our China and Russia when uh, the uh, meeting took place between President Xi and, and President Putin, but um, as I noted the other day, we hear very often uh, from, uh, from Beijing the primacy it places on uh, the sovereignty of, of nations. It says that's the most important um, element in, uh, in the international system. You would think, given that, that it would have expressed concerns to Russia about its threatened violation, renewed violation, 
uh, of Ukraine's sovereignty. Um, but you'll have to ask President Xi if he, uh, if he shared that with, uh, uh, with President Putin. Um, President Putin, as I said earlier, uh, has put in place the capacity to act very quickly if he so chooses. We're very focused on that. And uh, I continue to hope that um, he will not choose the path of renewed aggression, that he'll choose the path of uh, diplomacy and dialogue. But if he doesn't, we're prepared. Um, I cannot comment about Ukraine. But, um, but most certainly, I mean, we welcome the U.S. Um, you know, coming back into the Paris Agreement fold. And for us, that's critically important. And I think uh, the Secretary Blinken's presence here signifies that. Um, and for us, you know, climate finance, for example, we talked about finance, equates to development finance. And the ability to get some of the larger countries to be able to participate in the Paris Agreement and their willingness to listen, understand, and indeed engage with Pacific Island countries is most welcome as we would welcome any other country that is very much in the same space as us in respect of addressing issues pertaining to climate change. And, and just to come back to the, uh, I apologize, I'd forgotten the last part of the multi-part question. Um, this is not at all the uh, case of us being here, coming here, being focused here for, uh, for security reasons. It's um, much more uh, fundamental than uh, than that, uh, when we're looking at this uh, this region that uh, that we share, we see it as um, the uh, the region for the future, um, vital to um, our own uh, our own prosperity, uh, vital to our own progress. Uh, Sixty percent of global GDP is here. Fifty percent of the world's population is here. Uh, and for all the challenges that we have at the at the moment, and that we're we're working on together, uh, it's also a source of tremendous opportunity, and that's what the the strategy that we put out uh, is all about. Uh, it is about, as I said, building a free and open Indo-Pacific, defending it with democratic institutions, with transparency, uh, with um, a commitment to a rules-based order that we that we share. It's about connecting uh, our countries together, uh, deepening and uh, stitching together different partnerships uh, and alliances. It's about building shared prosperity uh, with new approaches to economic integration, some of which we talked about today, with high standards. Um, yes, it is about security. Uh, and uh, we've been, uh, we're working through the strategy to deepen integrated deterrence across the, the region, the inter interoperability of our, our forces, um, uh, and Ultimately, it's also about resilience, uh, coming together to end COVID, coming together to deal with the climate crisis, uh, coming together to build back better from the, uh, uh, the economic uh, crisis that has resulted uh, from, uh, from COVID. So um, this is a, a, a strategy for the long term because we see uh, our long term future uh, in the Indo-Pacific. It's as simple and basic as that. Thank you.